welcome back fellow Audi enthusiasts. If you're new to the channel, well, welcome and come along with me on my audio journey. Today's episode is made thanks to my friends at the Music Room in Erie, Colorado. Duncan, take it away. The Music Room is the world's leader in used hi-fi audio and a dealer for many of the best brands in the business. We've heard it all and we know what works. All right, everybody. If you're a Yankee like me, you're just not really familiar with the Canton brand. They're just, they don't, they have not had much of a major presence in the United States or North America for that matter. And that's really interesting because for the year 2022, Canton's celebrating 50 years of being in business. That's right, they started selling their equipment back in 1972. And as a matter of fact, check out this beautiful pair of 1980s ergos I saw on sale recently. These are some big mofo speakers, dual 12 inch drivers, well over 100 pounds a piece. Really cool looking speakers from a vintage perspective. So they obviously have cut their teeth and they've got the chops that they've been building some nice speakers for a long time. They just, for whatever reason, haven't made it big in the United States. As a matter of fact, the other interesting thing about Canton is through 50 years of business, they're still independently owned and operated as a family. And that's in their facility at Wildrod, Wheelrod, Germany. Yeah, I know. I screwed that up. Whatever. I'm not German. The Germans. Uh, Mr. Waltz might be able to, uh, you know, help me out there. Anyway, um, where was I? Yes. I've been living with, I've been living with these Chrono 90 DCs for the better part of the last month. Now, the other thing I would say is Canton is something like the third largest loudspeaker company in all of Europe. Wow, third? No offense, you guys seem like you're a distant third when it comes to your placement over here in the United States when you think of where Bowers and Wilkins are at and especially the popular growing popularity of folk house speakers. They got some serious presence here in the States and when you think of those two and even Dolly's been making some headway here lately, where's Canton at? Well, you know, maybe the music room's gonna help change that. Nevertheless, I've got the middle child. I've been living with the middle child speaker here for a better part of a month and these are smack in the middle of their catalog. By the way, they got a lot in that catalog. If you go to their website and download the, the corporate catalog, they've got integrate, integrator speakers, they've got Bluetooth speakers, they've got powered sound bars, they have the latest um, Smart Vento, which is like a $7,500 active wireless speaker. Um, who are they going after? But nevertheless, yeah, they've got a lot going on, a lot of choices in their lineup and so the very range topping reference K and the second below that is the Ventos. I want to say that those Ventos and range and reference K's those are the actual true um, German made speakers designed, developed, built, manufactured, tested, assembled, etc, etc all in-house at their German manufacturing plant. There's some value engineering in the uh, SLs and the Chrono lineup. These are made in the Czech Republic, not China, the Czech Republic. Okay, value engineered. We're gonna get to that in a minute. So let me jump into the fit and finish and the build quality, shall we? Yes, let's. The good, the things I like, the things I, I want to praise Canton for. The drivers, these mixed alloy aluminum manganese drivers. They're like titanium and, and um, they're titanium and ceramic in the, the reference K and, the, and a portion of that in the Vento. But in the SL and the Chrono, <clears throat> these are an aluminum manganese mixed alloy drivers. All three of them, this is a three-way design. The seven and a half inch woofers, impressive. I pull those out, here's the video of all the drivers that I, that I took for you. 
Those are robust magnets. These are some serious drivers here. And we'll talk about what the claimed frequency range is in a minute. But what really surprised me, and it was a booger to manipulate out, was that tweeter. Look at the magnet structure on that tweeter. I almost couldn't pull it out of its, its little home there because the magnet was nearly the same size as the opening. And, the, and whoever soldered it in place left zero room for error with the leads. There was not enough slack to fully pull the, the tweeter out. It is a sealed design, a sealed tweeter. It has no venting on it, which is what allows Canton to place that tweeter within the open woofer cavity. Um, if it was a, a um, if it was a vented tweeter, you're gonna, you can't do that. You're not supposed to do that. The air pressure would screw with the tweeter, but since it's sealed, no problem. There's a brace right here between the two woofers. And then as you move on up, luckily the mid-range driver, the six and a three-quarter inch mid-range driver, is in its own sealed cavity with its own um, polyfill. And as you can hear the difference there with that, adds a little bit of stability to it there. Okay, good drivers, very pleased with the drivers. Around back, you have a very large rear, fi rear firing reflex port down below. Not a fan of a rear firing port, but nevertheless, the binding posts, kudos to Canton. I, will, I did the Danny test. I have my 30 pound magnet and I pushed the magnet and slid the magnet all over everything, including the jumpers. And there was nothing that stuck. I took the jumpers out. The jumpers had no ferrous material in them, did not stick to the magnet. So, so nice job there. I could say there's some more expensive speakers that don't. Uh, pass the magnet test. Nevertheless, the dual board crossovers, at $3,000 I feel that the crossovers are, are about on par for what I would expect. Nothing special, electro, electro, uh, electrolytic caps, sand cast, and the, <clears throat> and the coils are what, the copper coils are what they are. It's about average, um, you know, being a dual board and it's split, you have the, the lower board that just handles the low frequencies, which cuts off at 300 hertz. And then you have the mid range that starts from 300 and stops at 3K. And the tweeter takes everything uh, above that, which I would also say is, is pretty impressive that the, they let the mid range really take the bulk of the work with the voices and that, you know, that plays into the later attitude. This, this baffle, this front baffle, that's not paint, it's not a gloss. It's what Canton calls a thick foil wrap. Let me just say this, I'm not a fan. It reminds me of a bad black automotive paint that if you look at it funny, it gets swirl marks in it. No matter how gentle I am, no matter how careful I am, it just seems like there's micro abrasions and swirls that keep showing up on this baffle. You may be the type of owner, you get the speakers, you pull them out of the box, you throw them in the corner and you don't touch them for 10 years, you don't even dust them. That might work. I just don't think it's gonna age very well. It certainly can't be moved too many times and you can't take the grill off too many times from that front baffle without leaving even more marks. I will say the magnets are hidden. The, bat, the grill is, is thin, it doesn't interfere with the speaker drivers whatsoever, and you could even be blind and slap that sucker on there. Very robust magnets, keeps them tightly to the front. For 100% of my listening time and playback, I left the grills on because I don't care for the baffle. Um, let's turn this around, shall we? You're greeted by acres, greeted by acres of this, this plasticky textured, micro textured vinyl material. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of this at all. This is the stuff of, of Ikea fandom. And I just think it's really unbecoming of a $3,000 speaker. If this was $1,500, like some of the others I've had, hey man, I get it. You know, Tecton's pretty butt ugly speakers at, at you know, $1,500 and below, but they play really well. 
we'll get to that. So, but at three thousand dollars, uh, uh, I have my I had my Opera Grand Mezza speakers, also three thousand dollars, Italian made. Yes, not actually assembled in Italy, but my God, those were beautiful speakers. Those are the kind of speakers that I hate to admit this. That when I walked by them, I gave them a little pat because I thought. Those are some fine-looking speakers. This Italian beauties we're talking about here. These over here, man, these are like six-pack speakers, if you know what I mean. you got to drink a six-pack to look at these speakers and say, oh, they're pretty good now. But you know what I mean by that, right? Okay, moving on. I think I've picked on them enough. Ah, oh, yes, one last thing. I do like the bass plinth. So the, uh, the plinth or the bass or whatever you want to call it, it is decoupled from the speaker itself. I, it's actually not one you have to assemble or screw in with four bolts. It does come already assembled to it. It has the um, spacers in there and there's about a good two millimeters of breathing room between the plinth and the speaker, so it's not attached. I've been waiting to say this, I gotta get this off of my chest. <clears throat> For $300 more, buy the Chrono SL 596.2 DC. Marketing team, QI roll. What the hell? Anyway, for $300 more, you're getting a much more wife approval factor friendly speaker, fully gloss. Uh, material in either white or black and I will say it steps up the 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 base and what I mean by the base as in the plinth design of the SLs you have a raised up plinth with the nice you know I don't know if they're faux aluminum or real aluminum but you actually have a down firing port instead of this rear firing port which means your room placement and your base distribution is going to be much better better integrated into the room with a down firing port, much more equal base distribution. And I just think for 300 more, that's the speaker that gets the check checkbox for me. Now, room placement, let's talk about that, shall we? Okay, I started these off with them on access, pointed directly at me, at my listening position, ports open, and it did not take long to get a interesting combination of completely underwhelmed and overwhelmed. And what I mean by that is that the imaging, the imaging was about this big, the soundstage was about this big, and there was a lot of information missing. The overwhelming part was these things put out a lot of bass and the bass was forceful and even I would say at times a bit muddy or uncontrolled. I do have a smallish room and so I'll blame part of that on my smaller room. So to illustrate that fact, a very specific song I played was um, The Police. I played Walking on the Moon. Within just a few moments of that track, you have a very distinct drumstick smack to the top rim of the snare drum. That snick, you should hear a minimum one third to a half a second decay of that note in any setup I've ever had. I would hear a good half second um, decay of that note played in the room. And not only was it a dull thud, there was no decay. So on axis, I heard zero decay and I go, wow, I'm missing way too much information already. So I used that song over and over and over to get to a happy place. And here's, here's the setup that, I, that uh, I ended up with for all testing moving forward. Two pairs of socks stuffed in the base ports and they were fully uh, facing forward at 45 degrees off axis. On hand, on tap for the side-by-sides with my Harbeths and the Chrono was, I have the M10, the NAD M10 V1. I have the NAD C388 with the blue, the blue OS module. And I have my trusty Peachtree combination kit here with the very fine i5 Zen Signature 1 DAC. What a great little Bluetooth DAC that is. Um, 
I had the M10 connected to the Harbus most of the time, and then I went back and forth with the Peachtree and the C388s because it just it really played to the strengths of the of each speaker better. And with the help of my trusty dB meter, through all playback, each of the speakers were within three quarters of a dB um, at all listening levels. So you know, fair play. All right. Shall I say it? Shall I say it? The frequency range. How could I forget that yet again? Oh, that's a big one. This one's that that's the one part of this that kind of frustrates me with Canton is they throw out a crazy claim. Here it is. Here are the specs for the the Chrono 90 fellas. I say fellas because I have zero female watchers, not even my own wife. <clears throat> uh, yes, the frequency range. There's a claimed 20 hertz frequency range for these speakers. These are $3,000 speakers. What are you talking about? They do play up to 40K. So many tweeters are pushing the envelope. None of us can hear beyond 19K as it is. If you say you can hear 20K, yeah, okay. Nevertheless, 20 hertz, really, guys? I want to see the data points. I want to see under what conditions you achieve that in a residential environment, how large the room was, and at what sound pressure level did you achieve 20 hertz? Because I'll talk about what I tried later. Uh-uh, not happening. Nevertheless, versus my Harbeth C7 ES3 XDs. God, I need some regular American names for my speakers. Nevertheless, I will hand it to Canton. They deliver on the value proposition. These speakers at $3,000 perform very well. As a matter of fact, uncomfortably close to my Harpeths. And to... To, to put it this way, track after track, it goes like this. I would switch from song to song, play the song through, start over, play the song through, start over. And the theme that I was getting is that obviously from the bass perspective, these bad boys put out. They've got the slam, they've got energy, they've got force. They play very cleanly. They play very undistorted. Uh, I'm going to say it like this. They really remind me of a Heritage Series Klipsch. You could put the power to these bad boys, and because of those robust magnets, they will just play and play and party, and they don't stop until you drop. The Harbus, on the other hand, they are the finesse speaker. With each track... The underlying theme is that the Harbeth strength is that they beat the Canton with inner detail. They beat the Canton with voice tonality, with low-level intelligibility. Now, let me talk about that. Here's the one thing that was hard for the Kronos to pull off. So at night listening, lower levels, you're below 80 dB, um, probably around 70 to 75 dB. I found myself going to the volume and I kept ticking up and ticking up and ticking up trying to match the low level detail that I could hear from my C7s. And that just goes to show that the C7s are just they're excellent low level detail speakers. They really get the micro details right. And uh, another track that illustrates that difference for me would be with um, Damien Rice. The album nine, well produced, excellent miking, and nine crimes. The key difference with that song is summed up in just one part of it: Damien's vocals. Now, when listening to Damien's vocals in that track, the key difference with the Harbeths is that every time Damien clips and stops his his vocal note. You can hear the room interaction. You can hear the reverberation almost like sonar 
when he's done with each note, it goes into the room and it actually comes back and you can hear that like sonar through the harvest. I could not achieve that with the chronos without really turning them up and then it just kind of defeats the purpose at that point. So, you know, can they do it? You have to push them to kind of uncomfortable levels, but that's just the key difference in where, you know, the harvest strengths are versus the chronos. Now, talking about the bass, I did get with test tones a very reliable 30 hertz at all times. Reliable and at my comfort, my comfort level of dB playback. Attempting to get even to the 28 hertz level, and I got a picture here for you, I had to crank the volume up to um, very uncomfortable levels. And again, my room being so small, I have no idea how they achieved the 20 hertz sound, standing sound wave how big the room would have to be, but you just can't manifest it in my room. Now I will say, while I was running those test tones, this is another kudos to Canton, because I've heard other speakers just crumble and get crushed at achieving anything below 30 hertz. The rear port, even at uncomfortable dB playback above 95, I heard zero port chuffing. I heard no noise. I was actually quite surprised. I heard zero noise coming out of the back of these speakers. When I did some torture 20 hertz test tones that I couldn't hear the note, but the drivers, the drivers at that point, they were struggling and you, you heard the friction within the drivers. I heard nothing coming out of the bass ports, at least from you know two, three feet away when I kept playing the test track. I was very impressed with that level and that goes to again how robust the magnet structure and the way that they tuned they tuned the cabin in itself so for three thousand dollars that's your value engineering nice job canton on that to go back to my grand opera mazes i sung the praises of the mid-range and the tweeter that speaker has a beautiful tweeter wonderful mid-range but they hit a brick wall at 80 miles an hour at anything below 50 hertz. Those little five inch drivers, they just can't pump out any bass below 50 hertz. That's a $3,000 speaker. It's a beautiful $3,000 speaker. But these Germans, they would take them out back and beat the living daylights out of them from a cohesive package perspective. Top to bottom, dollar for dollar, the Kronos is a very well-developed package and will absolutely outplay the Grand Mezzos at $3,000. The only other speaker that I kind of had on hand um, in the prior couple of years was my uh, modified, upgraded Pendragon, uh, Siaz Pendragons. Probably equal on base. Those had those had the eight-inch CS drivers, excellent drivers. But the thing that pissed me off about those Pen Dragons is they did not have imaging. They did not have a wide sound stage. It was very narrow. No matter what I did, even if I went way off access, I just couldn't get those speakers to open up. The Chronos definitely could match within five percent of the Harbeths. Very large sound stage very good imaging in room, and it had that nice placement right in between the speakers uh, that I liked. It wasn't forward, it wasn't in my lap. And I will also say this, if you like home theater, I did throw these out in my front room because I wanted to see how different the bass would be in a, in a fully opened room. Wow, very thunderous bass. Still wasn't going to get close to 20 hertz, but very thunderous bass, excellent home theater speakers. If you're looking for some hard hitting left right mains, uh, it, you know, with music, these are great speakers to have for that. And I would definitely give the thumbs up, and I would definitely say to go buy the Chrono SL596.2. Twos. Don't throw your shoes at me, Terry. Um, if you're going to spend $3,300 or you find them 
on you know the used market or the pre-owned market at the music room i don't know what could beat those speakers the sl 596.2s mind you with the fit and finish quality that they offer the performance that they offer the frequency kick that they offer the cohesive package that they offer it's a great speaker I would pass on these because I'm biased. I just, I don't like the finish. But like I said, for $300, for $300 more, I absolutely would check the box with the Chrono SL 596.2 DCs. Marketing people, what the hell? Anyway, <clears throat> I didn't want to blabber on and on and on with, with this review. Uh, the music room is really just going to carry the Ventos and the reference Ks. Interestingly enough, the Vento 90s, which I, I do have one request, the cabinet is the round is the basically it's the rounded version. It is the titan mixed titanium drivers with the ceramic tweeter. Everything else kind of the same, a little bit heavier, a little bit more robust. But the drivers, the millimeters, the centimeters, the inches, whatever you want to call it, they're the same. So it'll be really interesting at, what is it, $2,300 more dollars, how much more performance you would get. As for these at $3,000, well, you know, It's hard for me to say, but I still want that extra 10% that my Harbeths gives me because I like listening at night and I like having that lower level detail intelligibility. My preference is I still keep my Harbeths, obviously, just because of this. If these were in white gloss, who knows? Nevertheless, um, they get my seal of approval for the SLs. And uh, that's about all I have for you guys. Um, good speaker. My first, my first full dive in with a Canton product. And I certainly look forward to uh, trying more of their, what they have in their lineup, especially the higher level speakers. <clears throat> Coming up next, I'm going to wait. It's a brand I've only had once before. It is a direct to consumer brand only, and I can't wait to get my hands on those gloss white speakers. No, not Canton, because it's not direct. Nevertheless, that should be enough for now. I wish everybody a wonderful week. I wish all of your families to have an excellent Thanksgiving. I know that dates this particular episode. I don't care, because that's me. Y'all have a great time. Thank you for joining me. And certainly thank you for Mr. Jorge M.